Bonjour à tous. Donc une, une fois n'est pas coutume, euh, nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir un, un membre de l'IAP euh, pour le, le séminaire euh, hebdomadaire. Et en l'occurrence, il s'agit de Jean-Baptiste Fouvry, récent embauché euh, CNRS euh, au laboratoire. Euh, Jean-Baptiste, euh, tu as fait ta thèse au laboratoire avec Christophe Pichon. Mm -hmm. euh, tu es parti ensuite pour un postdoc à l'IAS à Princeton avec Scott Tremaine. Euh, tu travailles euh, sur euh, la dynamique des, euh, des galaxies et, et de la matière noire, en gros, mais je dis sans doute des bêtises. Euh, et euh, du coup, tu vas nous expliquer tout ça. Et, euh, et merci d'être là. Perfect. Ok. So it's working, the mic, is it? No? It's not. It should. It was. C'est censé. Vas-y, reparle. Hello, hello. Parce que c'est trop loin, on va le mettre là-haut. C'était bien quand tu bougeais pas. Ouais. Vas-y, reparle. OK, is it? Ouais. Yes. T'es trop grand, c'est ça Ah oui, OK. Okay, so I'm uh, very happy to be here and to uh, present to you some of the work I, uh, we worked on, uh, in particular during uh, my postdoc at uh, IS. And uh, this work is related to what we call resonant relaxation of stars, in super, in, uh, of stars around a supermassive black hole. So the question I will try to address today is how can we describe statistically the long-term evolution of stars orbiting a supermassive black hole? Okay. So the first remark I want to make is that this is a very generic question, and this is a question that we know how to address in statistical physics for a long time. So physicists, since the works of Einstein and Perrin, know how to describe the diffusion of a drop of ink in water. This diffusion is the illustration of a very deep and very powerful result of statistical physics called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. That tells you that there is a direct connection between the diffusion rate of ink and the power spectrum of the fluctuating forces acting on water molecules. And what I will try to argue today is that in the same way that ink diffuses in water, stars are going to diffuse in galaxies. However, there is one big change when I go from ink in water to stars in galaxies, which is the fact that stars in galaxies are driven by gravity. And gravity is a long-range interaction. This has two main consequences with respect to the diffusion undergone by the system. The first one is that if I want stars to diffuse, they will need to resonate. Otherwise, they will stick to only following the mean field orbit. And the second consequence is that stars have a mass. They live in the potential they construct themselves. So the system is said to be self-gravitating, which allows the system to amplify perturbation by collective effect. Studying the long-term evolution of stars in galaxies amounts then at studying the long-term orbital distortion undergone by a stellar system. The good news is that this is a very, very generic question that applies on all astrophysical scales. On cosmological scales, gravity is responsible for the formation of large-scale structures and define a complex and lively environment within which galaxies have to grow. If I zoom in a slightly bit more, on the scale of galactic disks, again, gravity is responsible for the long-term evolution of this system. And in this context, for example, in the context of the study of the Milky Way, the question of interest is the one of galactic archaeology. From the current dynamical state of the Milky Way, can I infer constraint on the past dynamical history of the Milky Way? In particular, in the context of the unprecedented da data from Gaia. But what I will be interested in today is on even smaller scales, which is the scales of galactic centers, such as Sagittarius A star, the galactic center of our Milky Way. Here, the question of interest is, can we describe the long-term evolution of a population of stars orbiting a supermassive black hole? In particular, we want to know how easy it is for a star to fall onto the supermassive black hole, Can we constrain for them from their distribution the spin of the black hole? Can we understand how easy it is to create gravitational wave sources in this regime or to test general rotativity? In particular, in the context of Sagittarius A star, this system is currently being monitored in great detail by the gravity interferometer. So this is the system I'm interested in today, which is the long-term dynamics of stars orbiting a supermassive black hole. However, If I want to study the long-term evolution of this system, there are a few key specificities of self-gravitating systems that I need to account for. Indeed, 
galaxies are what we call inhomogeneous system. By inhomogeneous, I mean that the trajectory of a typical star, such as the sun, is a complicated trajectory because the potential is far from being equal to zero. As a consequence, in order to describe this complicated motion, I need to construct the appropriate tool to describe these complicated orbits, which are called angle actions coordinate. Galaxies are said to be relaxed system. Here, relaxed means that they are on a, what we call a quasi-stationary state, which is a state dynamically frozen for the mean field dynamics. Galaxies are also resonant system. To any star, to any orbit, is associated a set of orbital frequencies that naturally introduce a dichotomy in time between the fast orbital time scale and the slow long-term time scale for secular evolution. And finally, and this will be essential for galactic centers, for galactic nuclei, this system can also be what we call a degenerate. Degenerate means that there exists some resonance condition that is satisfied by the orbital frequencies in the system. So in practice, how does one deal with the fact of having to deal with an inhomogeneous system? The key tool for this, it's called angle actions coordinate. And it is better exemplified by the case of a pendulum. So if I take a pendulum and I kick it, I can look at its trajectory in phase space. And I know that for a given energy, the trajectory of my pendulum will take the shape of a circle. The larger the energy, the wider the circle. If I want to describe in a simple way this complicated motion, I see that I need to do two things. First, I need to give a label to each of these circles. This is what we call the action J. Then for one action, for one orbit, the position of the particle along its orbit, along its motion, is given by a second number, which we call the angle theta. And this is very important. If I'm able to do this change, I'm able to transform this complicated motion in a very simple motion. Indeed, along the unperturbed motion, the action J is conserved, I stay on my circle, and the angle theta grows linearly with time with a certain frequency omega, the orbital frequencies. And this is very, very important. If I'm able to construct this angle actions coordinate, I'm able to describe complicated motion in a simple way. Actions are conserved, angle grows linearly with time with the orbital frequencies. Once you've constructed these frequencies or these coordinates, it's easy to say that the system is relaxed. The system is relaxed if it only depends on conserved quantity, which is to say if it only depends on my actions coordinate. And I also, once I have defined the orbital frequencies, I can also immediately see whether or not a system is degenerate. A system is degenerate if there exists some resonance condition satisfied by the orbital frequencies, which is seen here in angle space, where I can see that if a resonance condition is satisfied, the trajectory is going to close on itself. On top of being inhomogeneous, galaxies are also self-gravitating. This is to say stars have a mass, they construct the potential they evolve in, so they can amplify perturbation. They are submitted to two types of perturbation. This perturbation can either be internal, for example, due to the finite number of stars in my system, but they can also be external, imposed, for example, by the cosmic environment. And this stage of self-gravitating properties will allow my system to amplify and to respond to perturbation. In practice, how does it work? Let's say I have my galactic nuclei at my disposal and I decide to plug some external perturbation on it. This external perturbation will induce a response in the system distribution function. To any response, the distribution function is associated with a response in density. Now, since my density have a mass, I can plug it in Poisson equation and I get a response in potential. And this is where the magic happens, because I started with one potential perturbation and I have two potential perturbations. The one I plugged on my system and the response of my system. And this loop of amplification is exactly what we call cell gravitating amplification. This is the fact that my system responds to the external perturbation and its own response. The only thing I need is to have some perturbation on my system. And as I already emphasized, I can have two types of perturbation. They can be external, imposed by the cosmic environment, which can be described in the context of the Fokker-Planck formalism, which I will not touch at all uh, today. And they can also be internal, internal perturbation, for example, originating from the finite number of particles in the system. Okay. 
So this was very generic. This was the key properties of cell gravitating systems such as galaxies and galactic nuclei. And owing to this property, I can now summarize the typical fate of a cell gravitating system. So let me walk you through this diagram. Starting from some initial condition, my system will very rapidly undergo a phase of fast relaxation. This fast relaxation is sourced by the mechanism of phase mixing and violent relaxation and allow my system to reach what we call a quasi-stationary state. What is a quasi-stationary state? It is a state that is dynamically frozen for the mean field dynamics. It cannot evolve, it cannot keep exploring new distribution, except if it is feeling some perturbations. This perturbation can have two origins. They can either be internal, due to the finite number of particles, or external, imposed by the environment. This perturbation will then get amplified by self-gravity, and because my system is resonant, this perturbation can couple to each other through resonances. And this leads exactly to what we call secular evolution. So to summarize, what is secular evolution, the process I'm interested in today? It is a long-term evolution of quasi-stationary states allowed by perturbation, amplified by self-gravity, and coupled by resonances. And this is exactly the type of long-term processes I am interested in, and we are going to try and apply in the context of galactic nuclei. So again, my objective is so to describe the long-term dynamic of a cell gravitating system such as the galactic nuclei. And to do so, the method I'm going to use is based on new quasi-linear approaches that stem from kinetic theory. There are many gains from this new type of approaches. First, for the first time, we now have at our disposal new self-consistent equations that allow us to account for the long-term effect associated with cell gravity and resonances. Of course, these offer new physical insight on this complicated long-term dynamics, and more importantly, it's a complementary approach to more traditional techniques such as n-body simulation. Okay, so this was very, very generic. A, a cell gravitating system relaxes and can keep evolving only under the effect of perturbation. Let me now show you how this general concept can be applied to describing the dynamics and the long-term dynamics of a galactic nuclei. So this is the object we are interested in today, which is the dynamics, for example, of Sagittarius A star, the galactic nuclei of our own Milky Way. This animation here, I want to stress, it's not an n-body simulation, it's a true observation of the dynamics of what we call the cluster of S stars in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way. This is a true observation where, in the span of 20 years, we have been able to resolve the uh, detailed orbital dynamics of stars in the vicinity of this supermassive black hole. The astrophysical question in that context is in particular to be able to constrain the diet of supermassive black hole. We want to know what is the statistical distribution of eccentricities and orientations of stars in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole. We want to know how these stars can change in eccentricity, in orientation. We want to know in this complicated environment, how easy is it to create gravitational wave sources or how easy is it for a star to fall onto the supermassive black hole. So this is exactly the system I will be interested in today, which is the dynamic of a population of stars surrounding a supermassive black hole. And we want to know what is the long-term dynamics of stars in this very dense system. The first remark is that galactic centers are among the densest system in the universe, the densest stellar system in the universe. On the left, this is an observation of Sagittarius A star, the center of our Milky Way. And this scale of one parsec is what we call the sphere of influence of our uh, supermassive black hole. Within this domain of one parsec, you will find twice four million solar masses. There is one dark, extremely compact object that weighs four million solar masses, which is a supermassive black hole. And then surrounding it, there is also four million solar masses in stars. So within this domain of influence, I know that my supermassive black hole is going to do most of the job in driving the dynamics of the star. So we will be interested in the dynamic of this extremely dense stellar system surrounding the supermassive black hole. On the right here, I illustrated one fiducial simulation of such a system where you can see that indeed it's an extremely dense system and it seems very tough for us to be able to disentangle the dynamics of stars in this extremely crowded environment. On the other hand, the fact that the system is so crowded, that the number of stars is so large, is a good news for us. 
because it tells me it's a perfect regime for me to apply statistical physics tool. I mean, the sufficiently large end limit so that I could apply tools from kinetic theory and statistical physics. Let me take this simulation now and throw out most of the star just to highlight a bit how a given star is going to evolve, which is illustrated here. And now if I look carefully at the motion of my stars, I see that indeed this motion, at least at leading order, is sufficiently simple. It takes the form of a closed Keplerian ellipse. When I say this, I say two things. First, I recover the fact that the mass of the black hole is so large compared to the mass in stars. So indeed, it is doing most of the job in driving the dynamics or the leading dynamics of the star. The second remark I can make is that my orbits are closed. They take the shape of closed Keplerian ellipse. And this is the imprint of the fact that my system is degenerate. The fact that the orbit is closed tells me there is a resonance condition that is satisfied by the orbital frequency. Once I look at this, and once I remember the black hole is so massive, the natural thing to do is to perform one orbit average. We want to say this motion along the ellipse is so fast that I might as well forget about it, smear the stars along their Keplerian ellipses, and rather than studying the dynamics of stars, I will study the dynamics of these Keplerian ellipses. So the fancy name for this is called performing an orbit average, which is what we will now do. So I told you in introduction that systems are inhomogeneous. So I need to construct my good, or my good orbital coordinates. I need to construct my angle actions coordinate for this particular case. Here, we are lucky again, because this is something well known. We know exactly what are the appropriate angle actions coordinate for the motion imposed by a central massive object. These are called Delaunay variables, or in planetary dynamics, these are called orbital elements. So once, I replace the star by its fast Keplerian motion. Once I replace the star by its Keplerian ellipse, I need now to construct the coordinate to describe the state of my Keplerian ellipses. And the Keplerian ellipse is going to be described by five numbers. Two of these numbers are the semi-major axis and eccentricity. This just tells me what is the shape of my wire. An additional number, omega, is the phase of the pericenter. It allows me to keep track of the motion of the wire in its orbital plane. And the last two numbers are the orientation of the angular momentum vector, or say differently, simply the orientation of the orbital plane. So once I've done this orbit average to describe the long-term dynamics of a galactic nuclei, I need to describe the long-term dynamics of these quantities. I want to know how I'm going to change the distribution of wires I have at my disposal in my system. Okay, so I've done my orbit average, so I replace stars with wires, and now I ask myself, what can happen to these wires? Well, two things can happen to these wires. First, they can undergo what we call an in-plane precession, which is just a precession of the phase of the pericenter. What would, could be the source for this precession? Well, there are two main sources for it. First, the potential constructed by all the other stars is going to source some of this precession. And since my black hole is so massive, it will also induce the relativistic precession of the wire. That will lead it to precess in its orbital plane. These are second order effects that come on top of the dominating fast Keplerian motion, and this will be essential to describe the long term orbital distortions undergone by the system. In addition to the in plane motion, these wires can also undergo out of plane precession, where you see that the orbital plane, the orbital orientation of the wire, gets to change. Origin for this precession can be twofold. It can either come from a non spherically symmetric distribution of stars that will have a specific direction and therefore will induce an out-of-plane precession. And it can also be induced by relativistic coupling with the spin of the black hole. All these precessions are constructive. My pericenter is going somewhere. My orientation is oscillating around some direction. Of course, I have a finite number of stars at my disposal. So I have Poisson noise in my system. So on top of that, I will have finite n effects. I will get this quantity also to jitter around. OK. So these precessions are kicking in, and I can ask myself what will be the long-term impact of this precession on the dynamics of my wires. Well, these two precessions can induce two long-term dynamical effects in my system. On the one hand, as a result of the in-plane precession of the wires, my star will, or my ellipses will undergo what we call scalar resonant relaxation. So scalar here means that the quantity that will get to diffuse is the norm of the angular momentum, which is another way of saying the quantity that will diffuse is the eccentricity of the wire. So as a result 
of the in-plane precession, stars will couple resonantly and will undergo diffusion in eccentricity. I will, get, I will get the shape of my wire to change. Similarly, as a result of the out-of-plane precession, I can get the orbital orientations of my wire to change, so I can get the direction of the angular momentum to change, and this is what we call vector resonant relaxation where here vector means that the quantity that will change is the orientation of the angular momentum vector. Okay, so if you recall, the first thing I did, I said the black hole is so massive I will replace stars by wires. And then I will only see wires discussing with wires. Well, this is not exactly true, because if I wait long enough, at some point I will not get wires discussing with wires, but I will get stars discussing with stars. And this is the last process that we call non-resonant relaxation. So what is it? It means as, as my star is following its dominating mean field Keplerian motion, at some point, it will get by another star, and it will undergo a tiny deflection in velocities. And you see, as it moves through this crowded environment, it will undergo a series of kicks and deflection. And all of those will slowly pile up, and will slowly lead to additional orbital diffusion in the system. This is what we call non-resonant relaxation, non-resonant because I did not rely on orbit average. It is the slowest process of them all because it, because it is uncorrelated and it is sourced by tiny deflection, but because it is the only process where I did not rely on orbit average, it is the only process where I am immune to adiabatic invariance, or say differently, it is the only process that can get the semi-major axis to diffuse. Okay, so this was a lot of information, so let me sum it up again. So what are the time scales in the galactic nuclei? So the first time scale is a dynamical time. The black hole is so massive that my star wants to follow this Keplerian ellipse. This is a fast motion. It's so fast, I want to replace stars by wires. What can happen to my wires then? The second stage is for my wire to undergo some in-plane precession. This in-plane precession is sourced by the potential from all the other stars and also by the relativistic corrections due to the coupling with the central black hole. The next stage is a stage of vector resonant relaxation. This is a stage during which the orbital orientations of my wire get to change slowly as a function of time. If I wait long enough, as a result of the resonant coupling between the in-plane precession, I will also undergo what we call scalar resonant relaxation which is the relaxation of the norm of the angular momentum, or say differently, the relaxation of the eccentricity of the wire. And the last step is a step of non-resonant relaxation, which is the long-term consequences of the slow buildup of tiny deflection as the star is moving along this wire. And it is the slowest process of them all, but it is also the only process that can get the semi-major axis to diffuse. Here, there is one good and one bad news here. The good news is that this time scale are extremely hierarchical. They are nicely ordered. So this tells me if I'm interested in one time scale, I can average about I can average on everything that happens faster and I can freeze everything that happens slower. This is great news. But this is bad news for people that do n body simulation. Because of this huge dynamical range, you cannot hope to resolve all of them at once. You either need smarter ways of integrating or you need statistical tools to tell you what is the long-term imprint of these uh, resonant processes. Okay, so this was quite, uh, quite broad and now we'll start to go uh, slowly more into the details and I will try to emphasize in practice how can one describe precisely the dynamics of scalar resonant relaxation and the dynamics associated with vector resonant relaxation. Because it is a slightly simpler process, let me start with the process of scalar resonant relaxation, which is, once again, the relaxation of the eccentricities of Keplerian wires in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. Okay, so what is the picture? The picture is as follows. I have a wire at my disposal. As a result of the potential from all the other stars and the relativistic precession, this wire is precessing. So blue and red wire are precessing. If I'm lucky, they can be in resonance on their precession frequency, which is just to say they undergo in-plane precession with matching frequencies. Another way of phrasing it, there exists a rotating frame in which they always see each other under the same angle. Because they are in resonance, they always see each other under the same angle, they are very good friends, they stick together, and therefore they can discuss and couple to each other. And it is exactly these coherent and resonant couplings that are the source for the scalar resonant relaxation. 
So if I look at it in orbital space, illustrated here by eccentricity and semi-major axis, so that one point here is one particular wire shape. What I need to do, if I am wire red, I need to look around and find all the other wires that have the good idea of processing at the same rate than me. All the wires I can discuss with for a long time. And this is exactly what happens for the blue and the red wires. They satisfy a resonance condition on their precession frequencies. They can therefore stick together and can induce a diffusion in eccentricity. The only thing I need is to have some fluctuations. I need to have a tiny bit more blue, a tiny bit more blue and a tiny bit more red orbit. I need to have some perturbation in my system. Here, I don't have any external perturbation. Perturbations are just due to the finite number of particles in my system. So I know that unavoidably, I will have Poisson short noise in my, in my system, which is exactly illustrated here. At some point, I get this Poisson fluctuation around the blue and the red orbit. And this is exactly the process of scalar resonant relaxation. Scalar resonant relaxation is the resonance between Poisson fluctuation in a discrete system allowed by the resonant coupling between in-plane precession frequencies. Okay, so I will not show you how one can derive the appropriate kinetic equations for this type of system. I'll go straight to the final result. And I will just try to highlight that in this equation, indeed, I can find back all the specificities I try to highlight throughout the rest of this presentation. Okay. So what is my goal? My goal is to describe how the distribution, how the distribution of wires in my system is slowly changing the distribution. So the quantity of interest for me is a distribution function of the shape of wires that I have at my disposal. I want to know how many wires of a given angular momentum on A I have, how many wires with a certain eccentricity and semi-major axis I have. And I want to describe how this function evolves with time. You can see that this evolution, it's a very, uh, very common shape, takes the shape of a diffusion equation. So it's a flux of a certain diffusion coefficient. And this diffusion coefficient tells me a, wire, a red wire of type L and A, of this particular shape, and this is how easy it is for it to change of shape. What is this diffusion coefficient? First, I see that its amplitude is proportional to the inverse of the number of particles. So the more particles I have, the smoother the potential, the weaker the Poisson fluctuation, the more I need to wait for these effects to kick in. I see that this diffusion coefficient also involves an integral over orbital space. This is just because my red wires need to look around and to find all the blue wires with which it can couple. So this is just scanning orbital space, finding places with which I can resonate. With which wires can I resonate? I can resonate with the wires with which I satisfy a resonant condition on the precession frequency, which is captured here by this Dirac function. It tells me I look around, I match the frequencies, I am a good friend with this wire, and therefore I can diffuse. And the efficiency of this diffusion is proportional to how many wires I have and how strong I want to couple to them. So this is a very generic uh, type of equation, but it tells you again that the picture is as I described. I'm looking around, matching a resonant, and therefore diffusing. The good news is that in a galactic nuclei, this type of uh, equation can be explicitly implemented. So we'll straightforwardly jump to the money plot, which is uh, illustrated here. OK, so let me walk you through this plot. Again, it's a plot in orbital space. So x-axis is eccentricity of the wire, y-axis is semi-major axis. To a point here is associated one particular shape of a wire. It's very circular on the, it's circular on the right and very eccentric on the left. And of course, I expect that as my wire gets more and more eccentric, at some point I get so close to the black hole that I will unavoidably fall onto it, which is represented by this white triangle. These are unallowed regions of orbital space. No wires can exist here because they will unavoidably be swallowed by the black hole. The background green contours are the level lines of the diffusion coefficient I just mentioned. They tell me, at a given place, how efficiently can I change of eccentricities as a result of this scalar resonant relaxation. Yellow means very fast diffusion, very fast change in the shape of the wire, and darker purple tells you that the efficiently drops inefficiently very rapidly. On top of that, I also highlighted in black the region of orbital space where this resonant relaxation is much more efficient than the non-resonant relaxation. So where this resonant coupling between processing wires is more efficient than the effect associated with localized scatterings. 
And finally, I'll highlight it with these red stars, the orbital parameters of the cluster of A stars observed within Sagittarius A stars, or the stars with which I showed you the animation and the observation previously. So this is great news. It tells me that indeed, if I want to understand the dynamics of this cluster of S stars, there is no way around. It is dominated. The way their eccentricity get to diffuse is completely dominated by these resonant processes and ask therefore for a careful determination of these effects. In order to further highlight the structure of this uh, diffusion coefficient, let me take it and slice it at a fixed semi-major axis. So I want to see how the efficiency of eccentricity diffusion changes as I get my wire circular or more and more eccentric. So I take this plot and I slightly slice it like this. And the result is illustrated here. So x-axis is eccentricity, circular on the right, very eccentric on the left. And the lines here illustrate the uh, strength of my diffusion coefficient in eccentricity. I will make two, ma I will make two main remarks on this, uh, on this um, coefficient. The first thing is, I see that here there is some extremely sharp drop in the efficiency of diffusion. I could ask myself, where does this come from? Well, the explication is quite simple. As the wire gets more and more eccentric, it will be more and more submitted to the relativistic precession, which diverges for extremely eccentric wires. So my wire moves to the left, gets more and more eccentric, and presses faster and faster under relativity. At some point, it processes so fast that there is no other wire that presses as fast, so that there is no other wire with which I can couple. And since I cannot couple resonantly anymore, I cannot diffuse anymore. So the drop in the efficiency here is simply an highlight of the divergence of the relativistic precession as wires get more and more eccentric. You could also be puzzled by these different bumps you observe in this diffusion coefficient. Are, these are simply highlights of the different resonance conditions I can match in my system. For example, I could do a one-to-one -one resonance or a one-to-minus-one -one resonance. So different resonances will lead to different bumps in the shape of my diffusion coefficient. And similarly, this last bump, this last bump here are bumps associated with higher order resonances in my system. So again, you see in the structure of this diffusion coefficient in eccentricity, the efficiency with which I can change the shape of my wire, all the imprints of the mechanisms I mentioned, in particular the one of resonant couplings. Okay, so this is great. Now we have, in this space, we have a careful determination of the properties of the diffusion coefficient at my disposal. And one of the gains from this is once you've characterized diffusion coefficient, you can use them to fake the dynamic of your system without integrating the n body equations of motion. If you have a diffusion equation at your disposal, you can generate fake random work of eccentricities from the careful determination and characterization of this diffusion coefficient. This is illustrated here, where again, we're in orbital space. And here, we highlighted the motion of stars in orbital space without integrating the equations of motion. This is not an n-body simulation. This is a Monte Carlo realization of the diffusion equation. What I want to highlight here is that if you know how to characterize diffusion equation, we then, you are then able to fake random realization without integrating the equations of motion. And this is a big gain, because these systems are extremely hard to integrate numerically. OK. So what is the link with Sagittarius A star? Having characterized in detail this diffusion coefficient, what can I use it for in the context of Sagittarius A stars? One thing I can do is to take my clusters of A stars and only look at their distribution in eccentricity. So I take this plot and I crush them all along the eccentricity line. And I ask myself, what is the eccentricity distribution of the cluster of S stars I observe in the vicinity of Sagittarius A star? And this is illustrated here by this observed cumulative distribution of eccentricity. This just tells me what is the distribution of the S stars I observe. And this is a very important result, because this line, the blue, the observed one, matches what we expect to be the thermodynamical equilibrium of the system. If this red star had been around for an infinite amount of time, we would indeed expect this blue line to match with the black line. This tells me that within their lifetime, these S stars have had the time to undergo sufficient of, uh, sufficiently strong scalar uh, relaxation so that they did reach their thermodynamical distribution. Now I can invert this constraint. I know the age of the stars. 
I know they reach their synamical uh, equilibrium, so it tells me that my relaxation has to be efficient enough. And my relaxation being uh, characterized by some properties on the underlying cluster, I can use this to obtain constraint on what I cannot see. So let me repeat again the argument. I observe the stars. They have a distribution that is fully relaxed, thermodynamically relaxed. I know their age. So this tells me the relaxation has to be efficient enough. And so from this constraint of having an efficient enough relaxation, I can put constraints on my mechanism and therefore on uh, what I cannot observe and what structure the properties of the resonant relaxation undergone by the system. Another avenue of using this type of resonant processes has also uh, been recently developed in the context of gravity's detailed observation of the motion of the star S2. So this orbit here, it's not a numerical simulation, it's a true uh, observation of the detailed dynamic of the stars that we call S2, which is one of the stars of the S cluster, one of the one you could see in the animation. And from this extremely detailed interferometric observation, gravity has been able to show that indeed the motion is mostly uh, Keplerian, and they are now slowly reaching a regime where we can track deflection from this dominating Keplerian motion in order to put constraint on what we cannot see, which would be the relativistic effect from the black hole or the kinematic effect from the underlying stellar cluster. So again, this time from the detailed, extremely detailed observation of one particular orbit, we can try and place constraint on the properties of what we cannot see from this uh, constraint and extremely precise observations. Okay. So this was uh, maybe too dense, but this was so in the uh, regarding the process of scalar resonant relaxation. So the relaxation of the eccentricity of wires in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. Now I want to turn on the other relaxation, uh, other resonant process in the galactic nuclei, which is called vector resonant relaxation. Here again, I repeat that when we say vector, we mean that the quantity that will diffuse is the orbital orientation of the wires. So I want to get the orbital planes of my wire to change slowly as a function of time. At this stage, I need to share one more good news with you, which is the following one. If I'm interested in the motion of the orbital orientation of my wire, I see that I need to compare two time scales. The first time scale is the time scale of the in-plane precession. How fast does my pericenter move around as a result of the stellar potential and the relativistic correction? The second time scale is a time scale for vector resonant relaxation, which tells me how fast does the orbital orientation of my stars move around. The good news is that the time scale for the in-plane precession is much faster than the time scale for the out-of-plane precession. So what I naturally want to do if I want to study this, since this part is so fast, I might just as well average over it. So what I will do is I will perform a second orbit average, this time over the in-plane precession. Doing so, I will replace this processing wire by the associated annuli. And so when I'm studying the long-term dynamics of orientation, I'm going to study the long-term dynamics of these annuli. Let me repeat once again what I did. At the first stage, I said the black hole is so massive, I will replace stars by Keplerian wires. At the second stage, I said the precession is so fast, I will average over it, so I will replace wires by these annuli, which is what I have here. When I'm studying vector resonant relaxation, the quantities I can diffuse is the orbital orientation of the wire, just keeping track of in which direction is my orbital plane uh, pointing to. Anytime I do an orbit average, it's called adiabatic invariance, anytime I do an orbit average, some associated quantity has to be conserved. Here I did two average, so I need to have two conserved quantities. In this context, the two conserved quantities are the semi-major axis and the eccentricity. Because I did two orbit average, I'm not allowed anymore to get this quantity to diffuse. These are frozen, and this can diffuse. Describing vector resonant relaxation amounts then at describing the long-term dynamics of long-range coupled annuli in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. This is the process I'm going to try and describe in detail. Okay. So following my two orbit average, I now have at my disposal a population of annuli. These annuli are characterized in particular by an orientation that just tells me in which direction does the orbital plane points to. And the Hamiltonian of my system, what describes the dynamics of my system, can be written in this very simple form. It simply tells me that the interaction with my system are the coupling between the respective orientation. I just need to know the angle 
between the two wires. And then I have some efficiency of coupling that is a function of my conserved quantities, which are semi-major axis and eccentricity. So again, my system is as follows. A population of annuli characterized by a direction that are coupled to each other through an interaction that depends only on their respective angle. For the aficionados of Hamiltonian dynamics, I can make a few remarks on this Hamiltonian. The first thing is there is no kinetic energy, because this was dealt with by the orbit average. The second property is that if my distribution of annuli is on average spherically symmetric, if I average over this Hamiltonian, I'm going to get zero. So if I was to launch an infinite number of annuli in my system, I, my orientations would not change. This is very different from what happened in scalar resonant relaxation. In scalar, if I was to launch an infinite amount of wires, my pericenter would still go somewhere. They would still process under relativity and the stellar potential. This is very different here. I don't have any constructive motion in my system. I only have perturbation. And this tells me already that the way I will deal with the kinetic description of the system has to be different. I see also that I have some additional frozen labels in my system. I'm not allowed to diffuse in semi-major axis and eccentricity. And I have some deep symmetry properties. In particular, there is no specific direction. The interaction between two annuli depends only on their respective angle. OK. So what does this system look like? Well, this is a typical n-body realization of vector resonant relaxation in a galactic nuclei. So what I plotted here is a unit sphere, a point here is a point that tells me what is the direction of this underlying orbit. It just tells me the location on the sphere tells me what is the associated orbital orientation. I also colored particles according to their attached frozen label, in particular to their semi-major axis. So light colors are, part are annulized with smaller A's, and darker colors are annulized with larger semi-major axis. So if we can look at this, uh, at this simulation, and at this stage, I can already make a few important remarks. First, if I look at it from far away, I can see that these motions are coherent on large scales. And this is very different from, for example, Brownian motion in a gas. This motion is coherent on large scales, and this is exact signature of a long-range interacting system. My system is not coupled by localized short-range interaction. My system is coupled by long-range interaction. The second remark I can make is that if you pick one particular particle here and you look at it carefully, you will see that on sufficiently short time scales, this motion is extremely smooth. Again, this is very different from the typical Brownian motion. On sufficiently short, short time scale, the motion is smooth, or it tells me that this motion is sourced by a time correlated noise. Again, very different than what you observe in a typical Brownian motion. I can also see that particles have preferred fronts. If you look carefully, some particles want to stick together, and they tend to stick together if they have similar colors, or say differently, they tend to stick together if they have similar semi-major axes. This just tells me that my frozen labels, like the semi-major axis and eccentricity, make it so that particles have preferred fronts in the system. An important property here, from this animation, it's impossible for you to tell me if I launched 10 minutes ago or 6 billion years ago. The system is stationary or statistically stationary in time, and this would be very important to construct its kinetic theory. And finally, there is some overall rotational invariance. There is no specific direction in this uh, long-range motion on the sphere. In order to highlight, again, the fact that this is a system governed by long-range interaction, I took the same simulation, and this time I pretended I was a test annuli launched in this system. And I asked myself, what would be my energy if I was moving on this unit sphere? And this is what is illustrated here, where the green colors highlight the level lines of the energy contours on the sphere. So a test particle would want to move on lines of constant color on this sphere. And again, you see that these level lines are long range. They take basically the, the entire shape of the sphere, and they are not... Um, sourced by a very fine structure on the sphere. The important remark here is that the time it would take me to rotate around one eddy in this, uh, in this, um, on this sphere is essentially the same time scale it takes for the overall lines to completely rearrange. So this is a highly temporally correlated system. The time to explore the sphere is the same time scale as the time for the overall distribution of energy levels to completely rearrange. And this is what makes this dynamics both interesting, but unfortunately harder to keep track of, because it's a long-range, highly correlated, highly correlated system. So in practice, how does one try to describe such a system? So what is my goal? 
My goal would be I'm interested in S2, so I want to be able to fake the way its orbital orientation is going to jitter around. So my goal is to understand the statistics of one particular test particle moving in this noisy environment. And what I can rely on is some deep cell consistency requirement. On the left, I have the overall population of all my annuli in this system. This population defines a complicated and noisy environment. Of course, things are moving around, so my potential is time correlated, position correlated, and things are jittering around. If I'm a test particle, I need to move in this correlated potential. So my bass generates a noisy potential that generates a correlated random work. But the important stage here is that, well, there is nothing particular with that, this one test particle. I could pretend that I will average over all these particles over the bass. So the, my bass generate a noise that generate a random work. And if I average this random work over all my bass particles, I need to construct back the noise I started from. And this is very important. This is the self-consistency requirement between the noise I construct, the random work I generate, and the ensemble average needs to give me back my noise. And this is essentially the way, uh, the, the tool one can leverage in order to describe this uh, random work. So if you want to deal with this cell consistently, you need to open the loop somewhere, so you need to start somewhere. So what I will do is I will say, okay, let me look at this bus of particles and let me try to characterize the properties of the correlated uh, potential fluctuation generated by this system. So the, I have only two slides with, uh, with equation, but I just wanted to, I will not go into the detail, I will just try to highlight the way one can deal with this type of dynamics. So what's my goal? I have this complicated unit sphere, I have stuff moving around, I have this bath of particles generating a noisy environment. What I want to characterize is what is the potential fluctuation it generates. So what I do is I put two probes on the sphere. I put a probe at a certain location on a certain time, and I put another probe at another location at another time. Characterizing the potential fluctuation in the system amounts to characterizing the correlation between what I see here at this time and what I see there at this other time. And this is my goal. If I know this correlation function, I will know the properties of the potential fluctuations in my system. So how does one deal with this? What you need to see is that the properties or the state of your bass is fully characterized by the instantaneous distribution of, your, your test, of all your bass particles. You see, this function here tells me if I know exactly where are my bass particles, essentially I know exactly my system. So I can use it to describe the correlation in my system. The difficulty starts by the fact that this function, which exactly tells me how my bus looks like, evolves according to a quadratic evolution equation. And this is what will make the characterization of this correlation difficult. I will not go into the details, but there are ways one can deal with the description of this correlation function and infer what should be the time correlation of the noise generated by this bus. Once I have characterized the noise from the bus, I can use it and plug it onto a test particle. Now I'm just going to be a probe, I'm going to be a test particle evolving in this noisy environment. So I'm this black particle, I'm launched here, and I will end up there at some time. And when I want to know what is the correlation between where I started from and where I ended up later on. The location of my test particle, again, is exactly given by its location of the sphere at a given time. The evolution of this function, this time is not going to be quadratic, but it's going, so it's going to be linear, but it's going to be sourced by this complicated correlated noise I just characterized. So now the game amounts to characterizing how can I build up correlation in the trajectories of my test particle sourced by this correlated noise I just started from. I realize that in practice this might sound extremely obscure, what I'm saying, I'm just saying the important step is this self-consistency between the noise my system generates, the random work it can use for one particular particle, and then I need to close the loop again. In practice, once you've done this, you're able to characterize the random work undergone by a test particle. So what is the correlation between where I was launched initially on the sphere and when, where, where I ended up later on? For people studying diffusion processes, this is an extremely classical plot, which just tells you that on time scale sufficiently short, you are in what we call the ballistic regime, the super diffusive regime, where correlation grows like the time square. And then at some point, when your system has completely rearranged, you, undergo, you enter the diffusive regime. Again, this sounds obscure, but what do I gain from this approach? What I gain from this approach is I can again forget about now running any new n-body simulation. So on the left, 
is one particular random walk of the sphere of one orbital orientation. So this spaghetti on the sphere was computed by integrating the n equations of motion. So it was very complicated because the difficulty scales like the number of particles squared. On the right, this other spaghetti was obtained without integrating any equations of motion. What I used was a statistical characterization of the correlation in the system, and I used it to fake random work in my system. So again, without integrating any equations of motion. Of course, you can see statistical difference between these two type of uh, between these two type of random works. In particular, this one has structure on smaller scales, and this one does not. But the good news with this is, is now I can pretend I know how to fake how a given star is going to jitter around in a given galactic nuclei without having to integrate any equations of motion. Okay, so how can I use this or what is the relevance of this process in the context of the uh, observed structure of Sagittarius A star? So this is given here in this observation plot. So this rugby shape should be interpreted exactly at the same as previously. You know, I had this unit sphere where particles were moving on orientation on this sphere. So I take this sphere and I collapse it onto this, uh, onto this rugby shape. And this is exactly what is uh, being plotted here. A point here tells you what is the instantaneous orbital orientation of the stars observed in the vicinity of Sagittarius A star. So a dot here is not one of my fake uh, n-body simulation. It's truly what is being observed in the vicinity of Sagittarius A star. And what people have noticed is that there seems to be a clump of stars here that have very close on the unit sphere. Or say differently, if you have very similar orbital orientation, it means that these stars seem to be orbiting within the same disk. Yeah. So the question is, how likely was it for these stars to align on a very similar uh, orientation? Or say differently, since my system is so noisy, how likely was it, is it for them just to spread apart and diffuse on the sphere? So I want to use the observed clumpiness of orientation as a constraint on the efficiency with which the orientations of my stars can get to change in my system. And this, this is a process that I would call neighbor separation, which tells you you have stars with very similar orbital orientation and you want to ask yourself how easy is it for them to spread apart and diffuse. And this is illustrated here on this n-body simulation of this problem. So again, I color particles with their semi-major axis and I launch them in this noisy environment and ask myself how fast did they move apart. What you can see again is that indeed particles have preferred friends. They tend to stick to each other with particles that have similar color. This is just the fact that if you have similar A's, you are going to be in a similar region of physical space, so of course you want to couple strongly and of course you want to stick together. And what I can see is that my population of neighbors is indeed slowly diffusing on the sphere, so indeed they are slowly forgetting about each other. And so what I want to do on the long term is to use the efficiency with which they forget about each other to put a constraint on the observed disk of stars in the vicinity of Sagittarius A stars. I know these stars have a certain age. I know they are clumped together. Therefore, I know that they should not spread too fast apart from each other through vector resonant relaxation. And therefore, I can put a constraint of this on, this, on the efficiency of this mechanism and therefore constraint on what I cannot observe. What makes this problem challenging from the analytical point of view is that there is two way stars can, two way neighbor stars in orientation can spread apart. They can spread apart because they have slightly different orientations. So they are not exactly in the same place on the sphere, so they want to move away. Or they can also spread apart because they have slightly different frozen parameters, slightly different A's. Therefore, they do not couple in the exact same way to the background, and therefore, they will also slowly move apart. So characterizing the dissolution of disks in uh, the vicinity of a galactic nuclei amounts to characterizing how fast this spot of stars is going to diffuse and uh, diffuse on the, uh, on the unit sphere. Okay, so as a conclusion, the uh, physical motivation for this discussion is, again, to constrain the uh, properties or the statistical properties of stellar cluster in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. We want to know what is the origin, the structure of the stellar distribution in the vicinity of Sagittarius A stars. We want to know how these stars can change in eccentricity, in orientation, how easy it is to source gravitational waves in this regime, or how easy it is for stars to decide to fall onto the supermassive black hole. 
I describe in detail two processes, one of them being the one of scalar resonant relaxation, so the relaxation of the eccentricities of wires, and a second process, the process of vector resonant relaxation, the relaxation of the orientations of orbit, orbital orientation of stars in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. I believe that some of the important novelties of this work is now to have new kinetic equations at your, at your disposal, not only written, implemented, but which are also on the verge of being confronted in details with numerical observation. And I would also like to emphasize again that galactic nuclei are, in some sense, by definition, uh, extremely hard to, to tackle through direct and body simulation, which makes the development of this statistical method mandatory. Of course, secular dynamics, as I emphasized in the introduction, does not limit itself only to galactic nuclei. It can be also implemented in the context of galactic disk, in the context of galactic archaeology, in the context of globular cluster, the so long-term redistribution of orbits in globular cluster, or even the long-term dynamics of dark matter halos. And I thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Je suis sûr qu'on va avoir plein de questions sur le libre arbitre des étoiles pour tomber sur les, euh, les trous noirs, sans trop. So in the in the second part on the vector uh, resonant relaxation, I noticed that you were using a Gaussian ansatz yes. uh, to try to solve the consistency relation, yes. and uh, it's it's a pretty good one, clearly. I mean, if it's a red one. But you clearly see also that there are, uh, you know, the, the tails are not as fat and so on. So this suggests that you would want to go to maybe like an edge worse expansion or something the next order. Sure. So is this something that you've been thinking about that you already implemented? Okay. Or is so this irrelevant? No, no. So it's uh, th there is two questions. There is one question: is am I satisfied with this plot? Yes. And the second question: does it matter for when I fake random walks? And so the way the, the reason, so I did not present these slides. But if you remember, I have this self-consistency requirement at my disposal. So what I do, I start with this ansatz. I generate random walks. I average over it, and then I have again self-consistency. So I can use my better estimation to generate a better noise. And this is what we did. So I could get this later <coughs> things much better just by you know, running the wheel and using the self-consistency. So I just did not present it. Yeah, but that will still keep the same functional form. Well, no, no, no. no. So I will, uh, I don't think I have the slide. Oh, no. uh, unskip. <laughs> Magic. Okay. So the idea is as follows. So the random work of a test particle is sourced by the bus. The average of all the test particles over the bus gives me back the noise from the bus. So what I do, I start with my Gaussian here, which is the best I could do. I fake the random walk, I average over them, and I get a better noise for the bus. And this is what is illustrated here. This is my bad Gaussian starting point, and then I leverage this self-consistency, and I get a much better heavy tail. It's not the Gaussian anymore, and I get long tails. Okay. And so how important this is? So this is not, in practice, it's, it's very not important. It's not that important. The question is, OK, there, there, are, there are two time scales in this system. There is what we call the torque time, which is if I was a test particle, I have this noisy bus, bus I freeze everything from the bus. And I just ask myself, within this noise, how much time would it take me for my test particle to do one entire sphere rotation? This is torque time, typical amplitude of the noise. Then I have the coherence time, which is I'm looking from far away and I ask myself, how long did I need to wait so that my bus does not look at all as it was before. The bad news for vector resonant relaxation is that these two time scales are very similar. Yes. So it's exactly at this stage that the magic is going to happen. And depending in which regime you are, you either do many, many, many rotations of the sphere before even starting to diffuse, or you just slightly move on the sphere and you've already completely diffused. And this, OK, then the devil is in the detail. So it depends exactly how, what is the structure of your galactic nuclei. For this fiducial example, it would only slightly uh, affect the late time behavior of the system, where essentially I've already covered my sphere, neighbors are only completely separated, so it's fine not to account for it. Thank you. So 
two quick questions. One, one is you said that uh, in the scalar resonant res relaxation, the, you have a trajectory in the ellipticity of the orbit, of the eccentricity, not ex sorry, the eccentricity of the orbit. Yes. Um, and you said that the time scale for that was faster than, um, than the vector resonant res relaxation. So can you still assume, uh, I mean, for the orbit averaging yes. of your wires, yes. do you assume that the, the eccentricity is constant? Okay, so, so is that approximation, uh, you know, is, I mean, to what extent is that approximation okay? Okay, so the thing is, and this is very subtle, but the scalar part happens after, after the vector part, not before. So at this stage, you see, I process, I jitter around in orbital orientation, and then I diffuse in eccentricity. It's not the other way around. So at this stage, yes, I can, in some sense, assume eccentricity fixed. But it's, it's, so I presented scalar first and vector, but in practice, vector kicks in first and then scalar. So, so in that sense, it's, it's okay. Now, of course, there are always subtle effects with orbit averages, all of this. I'm throwing under the carpet. So the second quick question was, what about the internal structure of the stars? If you have close approach to the black hole, I imagine tidal effects can, yes. can have uh, effects on the internal structure, which may change your conservation. Yes, okay. So, so this is... Um, Okay, there are, two, there, are two, there are two two answers to this. One of these is, okay, I need to be close to the black hole, so I need to play with this diagonal. I want to be in this vicinity. The question is, in these regions, am I still uh, impacted by these resonant processes? And from this plot, I see, okay, these do not matter anymore. So it's, it's a completely different physical regime where now I will really resolve the detailed interaction between one crazy eccentric orbit and just the black hole, and I can forget about the rest. You see it, for example, here with this tidal disruption line, or also here with this uh, dotted line, which is a gravitational wave emission line. If you're unlucky, you fall here, then unavoidably you will fall onto the black hole through gravitational wave emission. But at this stage, you can forget about the background cluster. You're completely, in some sense, uh, immune to it. If I would uh, describe all these effects by means of perturbation theory, that is, I would consider uh, the motion uh, uh, on a Keplerian orbit, and then I add a perturbation yes. due to either the other stars or the central black hole or whatever, uh, any uh, perturbation. In order to describe these effects, I should go to uh, which order in perturbation theory? I mean, the linear order in, in of okay. so celestial mechanics would be sufficient, or is it a second order effect because of some back reaction? So, so it, it depends what, what is your small number at your disposal. So here the small number essentially will be the uh, total stellar mass divided by the mass of the black hole. And then, the, for example, the, uh, the precession of the pericenter is a first order uh, effect in this because it's proportional to the, mass, to the ratio stellar mass over mass of the black hole. Then for, for scalar resonant relaxation, it's a quasi-linear equation, so I went to second order. The, the rearrangement in eccentricities are sourced by the correlation between fluctuations, so it's a second order effect. I need to, to correlate two fluctuations with each other. So it's essentially a first, at least for the, the way you, for the construction of this, uh, let's say, for the construction of this precession, I would say it's a first order type of effect. But then they get, they get coupled through Poisson fluctuations I have in my system. So then my other small number is going to be 1 over square root n, where n is the number of stars I have at my disposal. Okay, I am surprised because uh, the numerical simulation and body simulations of the motion of a star of, cl of, of stars, a uh, cloud of stars around the central black holes, has uh, been uh, very well reproduced by just linear uh, perturbation, uh, the standard equation of celestial mechanics. So, so in which context? What is in the context of galactic nuclei? Or? Yes, for instance, the simulation by uh, Merit or Alexander and... Sure, uh, and but so, okay. So this is... Uh, it's... Uh, one has to be very uh, cautious with this simulation. So at most, there was maybe 50 stars in this type of simulations. And it's, it's, um, it's definitely not in the same statistical regime that the true galactic nuclei is. And as soon as your number of stars is not that large, you know, n equals 50, then 1 over n, 1 over square root n, 1 over n square, all of these time scale starts to be of similar order, so everything gets mixed. So you really want to pump up the number of stars 
to nicely separate all the, all the time scales. And then there is a second effect of how self-consistent do you do your, uh, your dynamics. So I could be interested in the dynamic of one test star in this environment, which would be forced by the background uh, stars. But do I solve my background self-consistently? So do my stars in the background see each other, or do they just evolve in this type of mean field motion? There are many types of subtle effects that you may or may not have turned on that make it so that time scales are nicely separated or not. Not sure I'm convincing. So I'm curious about uh, the lens steering uh, precession. Yes. Is there any hope, do you th in your mind, to to get some constraints on the spin of the black hole? Uh, um, w obviously, we need better observations going fainter to to indeed increase the number yes. of stars to avoid this uh, the short uh, the, this uh, this. Uh, uh, finite star problem. Okay, so so I will get confused on the orders of magnitude, but the lens steering is going to be hard to get because I need to pay one over c in addition, and if I want to pump it up again, I need to get very eccentric, and the observed stars are not that eccentric, so it will not kick in that hard. The second issue with this is okay. Let's say I invest in gravity; they measure their 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 orbits uh, even hundred times better. This is just one kinematic measurement. And from this tiny deflection I would observe, how do I, how do I know if I was lucky, S2 was in a nice regime, or it got perturbed very locally? The only regime where this type of theories can apply in this statistical limit. I need a large mm -hmm. batch of stars, and then I can say something about their distribution. But for one particular star, I mean, it's, it's uh, how to say, let's say, if it, I observe S2 and I just infer the uh, precession rate of the pericenter. This is one number I extracted. I cannot hope to constrain everything from one number. Okay, of course I can do nicer. I can, along the orbit, I can try and track the deflections along the orbit. This is more information. But there is no way for me to tell me, oh, was I lucky or not lucky in my local Poisson fluctuation? Did something come by at this time or not? This I cannot infer. While in the stati stati statistical sense, I will be able to do it. So these type of kinetic approaches are much better suited for, uh, let's say, a statistical type of, uh, of constraints. So we have to wait many years that we have uh, 100 times more stars, yes. right? And, uh, and, uh, and with a long period all right, of observations to, uh, to see the evolution. But this is not so, uh, I mean, this is one of the, one of the issues with galactic nuclei is uh, there are not that many of them around for which we can obtain detailed orbital measurements. So in some sense, the sample of information we will infer on this type of system is very limited. So, but it's, uh, it's part of the game. Une dernière question. I'm just curious. I mean, as you said, I mean, you, you can now describe some, some small scale physics uh, in, a, in a quasi analytically or with an equivalent system which is sort of what is done in large scale structure by sort of sub, called subgrid or, you know. Now, what has, has this been used in the context of simulations where you can sort of now explore a much longer time scale? And if so, what are the new effects that emerged? Okay, so this, uh, um, okay, so I, I, there is one uh, very hard thing if you wanted to Okay, let's say I'm doing some simulation of galactic nuclei in an effective sense, and I want to use this to plug some effective recipe on how eccentricity is going to jitter around. And this, I, if I am able to do this, I do not need any more to solve for this fast dynamics. In practice, computing this type of coefficient is very expensive, and it's expensive for, for many reasons. First, everything happens in action space. So I need to go xv to theta and j. Second, I need to do some integral over space. Third, I need to solve a resonance condition. I need to compute some coupling coefficient between different shapes of wires, which z themselves involve some additional orbit average. And then the hardest complexity, which is not explicitly written here, but I also need to account for the fact that my system is self-gravitating. It responds to perturbation. So I need to compute what we call linear theory. I need to say how much my system wants to amplify perturbation. And this is a very challenging numerical calculation to do as well. So as of now, the equation is written as be computed at t equals zero, but we are not in a stage where I could say, okay, I can give you this effective recipe and let's plug it and, and move forward in time. This would be too... In some sense, yes. Yes. Sure, sure, sure. 
crois que sur cette perspective, il est temps de, de remercier encore une fois Jean-Baptiste.